Let's give these panoramic view of mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. See if I can do this in three minutes because we have so much to more ground to cover. We covered so much yesterday. It seems like what more could there possibly be on the path to enlightenment? But guess what? We've just gotten started. <clears throat> so we, we start out by, of course, the cognitive. And you'll be doing that one, you know, if you are having a well-balanced practice, a well-balanced diet, you'll be doing that one you know, regularly as part of your your regular routine, your, your practice over the course of months or years or so. You make sure that you include the cognitive. Why am I doing this practice? You know, is it for benefits of health, happiness, mental health, or do you have those kind of grand goals that are part of the practice of Buddhism, you know, kind of a, a real fundamental part. But you now it's very important that you decide yourself what it is, why you're doing this practice, because the practice, your motivation is going to determine the results that you get with the practice. That sounds really good. I mean, not what I just said, but the sound. <laughs> it was worth the effort. <laughs> okay, my three minutes are ticking. Uh, so then, we move from the connective. Now we know why we're doing our practice. And we move then to the attentional dimension. <clears throat> because it's so important to, you have to have some stable, vivid attention. If you're, you're basically multitasking, being distracted, or falling asleep through the entire day, like maybe your default mode, then you're not going to be able to, one, know whether you're making progress towards your goal, and you will not be able to then make any progress on the cognitive dimensions and emotional dimensions, because you need a very powerful uh, observational tool in order to do those, because you're looking at your moment-to-moment -moment experience, mental experience, when you get to the cognitive and the emotional dimensions. So you really, what you do is, first of all, develop the contemplative microscope or telescope. Alan always calls it a telescope because he's so fond of Galileo. But you, it's your observational tool. And then you, once you have the observational tool, then you do the contemplative science in Vipassana, in the balancing the cognitive dimension. So yesterday was all devoted to the attentional dimension, beginning with adding the mute switch to that default wandering mind. And we add the mute switch with tactile sensations, beginning, anyway. And so taking advantage of that fundamental fact that the mind can only be aware of one thing at a time. And so if we give the mind something to focus on, then it can't, we won't be assailed by that constant default wandering, anxious thoughts, fantasies, etc., that are taking us away from the present moment of our experience to fantasies of the future, memories, and perhaps disturbing memories of the past, etc. So we, if we're focused on tactile sensations, then uh, the whole program becomes how to sustain your attention. That's what the mind training is all about. Sustaining your attention on your chosen object. And so we then, um, first of all, we recognize that the Buddha actually gave us permission and instructions on four different asana positions in which to meditate. Shavasana, seated, standing, and walking meditation. So we have are working with three at least here because I don't want you to walk too far out the door because I know once you get out the door, who knows what you might find out there. That's more enchanting. So. Uh, we'll be working with the, the three here. And so every asana, or I'm sorry, every session that you do, we're, we're doing 24-minute gatikas, that, that approach. And you have then, and hopefully we'll get to three of those silent sessions today, along with the guided meditations 
if I am able to stay on track, we will have time for three silent sessions today. And then the strategy during those three silent sessions is to do a self-assessment. What does my attention need right now? And your basically the answer is going to be, does it need more clarity or does it need, need relaxation? Meaning, am I a, is distraction my problem or am drowsiness? And meaning, does my system, attentional system, have too much energy or not enough? Do I need a boost or blow off steam? So then you, the answer to that question of your, your self-assessment is going to determine which position you meditate in, either the more relaxed position to support relaxation, the antidote to distraction, or you will choose a position that promotes clarity, either the seated position or standing position. So that's the first choice that you need to make. And then you also have a choice of what to meditate on because I've already given you a, a number of choices about that. And that, again, is going to depend on your answer. Do I need relaxation or do I need clarity, invigoration? And so if, you, if your mind is very distracted, let's say you just got, you got a performance review on the way in this morning. Uh, and so that is just dominating your mind. The loop is playing over and over again and it won't shut up. What do you do then? Obviously, distraction is the problem. You go to the infirmary, as Alan calls it, which means that you choose the most relaxed position and you choose the more, most coarse object, the most coarse tactile object of the breath. And so, just again, does it matter which object you choose? We're, we're choosing one object to focus our attention on in this practice. And does it matter which object? that you choose, and so we say, yes, it does. The breath is the most effective for adding the off switch to the default wandering mind, and a lot of you know, reasons for that. But then you, so you then have the choice, along with the position to meditate in, the object to meditate on. You can choose the infirmary if you just got the performance review, if your mind is very distracted, and if you need more clarity, if you're feeling a little drowsy, along with choosing a more invigorating position to meditate in, you can choose an object that supports clarity also, or <coughs> produces vividness, if you're up to it. And so that would be then the more subtle tactile sensations of the breath at the nose, the Padmasambhava oscillation, remember invigorating your attention on each in-breath, deepening your relaxation on each out-breath. So that one can put you into such a fine balance of attention, you know, that uh, you can stay there for a long time and then feel the invigoration on every in-breath, feel the deepening release on each out-breath. But you're not going to be able to do that if you're being assailed by ruminating thoughts that have a lot of emotional charge, for instance. And then you have already one more choice, and that is awareness of the breath. So you can then shift to the awareness practice that we ended the day with yesterday, the new bridge technique that Alan just started teaching. And that is that this is the, this is the golden key, I think. This is what has been missing uh, and I think is the maybe the most exciting thing that I've learned recently. And that is this bridge technique, where you, you uh, what Alan calls mindfulness of the breath with a Dzogchen flavor, and what I call awareness of the breath. Uh, so this is then you are aware of the breath, and uh, first of all, aware of tactile sensations of the breath, and apportioning your awareness with 80% of your awareness aware of the stillness of your awareness, 20% then your peripheral awareness, aware of the tactile sensations of the breath. And then you shift that as you're maintaining the primary awareness of the stillness of your awareness, that glassy, calm surface of an immense body of water, unrippled, 
that then you shift your peripheral awareness to 20% to knowing the breath directly. So you switch from the tactile domain to the mental domain, and then you know the breath directly as the potter knows his wheel, as the Buddha put it. The, as directly, immediately as the potter knows the revolution of his wheel, or long is or short, you just know the breath is long or short. So then it becomes a mental experience. The breath becomes a mental experience. That is then the resolution, according to Alan, of the problem of the Sangha. So there you have it. That was. We could have saved a lot of time yesterday. <laughs> 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 So where do we go from here? <coughs> Into the world of Padmasambhava. And just, you know, um, so just one thing about this Padmasambhava. Um, I can remember when so, you know, I studied in the group tradition for 20 years, and I knew that, and actually I've had this relationship with Padmasambhava since I was 18, or not this relationship, but a, a relationship with Padmasambhava, and a very uh, important and powerful one for me. And then uh, after I started meditating and then got into Vajrayana, etc., uh, all of my practice, strangely, was related to Padmasambhava, even though I was getting no instruction on Padmasambhava. And so at one point, near the end of the Tantra course at Diamond Mountain, I went to Geshe Michael and Mom Christy after a lay run, and I said, look, I'm not going to be able to do this three-year retreat because I don't feel like I have the practice that I want for three-year retreat. And so as soon as I'm finished with Diamond Mountain, I'm going to go off wandering, looking for Padmasambhava practice. So that's exactly what happened. And so it, and then it was a natural transition uh, you know, etc. So it felt like I was had really come home. But um, the thing is that we don't have to. It's a very within. It was so interesting that within the 20 years or so that I was studying very intensely in the Gurukta tradition, there was very little <laughs> mention at all of Padmasambhava. He never comes up. You know, you go to Nepal or India or you know Ladakh, and Guru Rinpoche is everywhere. And, mm -hmm. Lama Zopa is building statues to Guru Rinpoche all over the place. But in our immediate tradition, I asked about uh, Padmasambhava and Geshe Mike and said, yeah, I think there is a teaching on Padmasambhava in the Guru I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> uh, but so the interesting thing was that you, it's not, even though, uh, you know, in our immediate tradition, uh, it's not emphasized as a practice or, you know, a tutelary deity or a great figure. Uh, in the rest of Tibetan Buddhism, you know, he is the man, uh, the and the, you know, the teachings. And so, just for instance, His Holiness says, according to Alan, who would know, uh, that in a conversation he said that His Holiness ranks in order of in his personal pantheon. The order of reverence is Shakyamuni Buddha, number one, Nagarjuna, number two, Padmasambhava, number three, Tsongkhapa, four. That blew me away when I heard that from the head of the Galupa order. <clears throat> so you don't have to think that you are cheating on your girlfriend or something. <laughs> 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 Getting Padmasambhava teachings. You know, his, his Holiness has uh, taught, has written two books on Dzogchen, for instance, has uh, had many, many teachings from uh, the, the head of the Nyingma order, uh, has taught Dzogchen in the United States uh, on two different tours, etc. So, you know, it's, it's just different angles uh, and different approaches and different ways of, you know, we can. Uh, talk to each other like we're family members, and you know when you're family members, you can have debates and disputes in ways that that you can't with a stranger, you know, or somebody who's because you know you, there's an intimacy. So uh, you know that's the whole approach. And 
honestly also, whenever we get to the point of talking about fine points of perspective on really extraordinary practices, I just think, oh my god, how, how unbelievable that at this time in the United States, in New York City, we're able to take you know, informed, experienced opinions from different angles on these high practices when 78 years ago, when Thales Bernard went to Tibet, there was nothing here. You know, and in that brief time, all of a sudden, all of us, you know, we've got this smorgasbord to choose from. It's extraordinary. So that's the spirit. Whenever, if I were to, for instance, sound critical of a particular Galupa approach to meditating, it's always with that wonder that, you know, wow, that here we are able to do that. So I hope that you. If I do, don't give me a slap or something, but just take it like that, okay? <clears throat> May I just offer something about this? Well, you know, I'm afraid oh, okay. that uh, for if we're going to get where we want to go, that we might have to yes. keep everything on track. Yes. But uh, anyway, so but you see, I just went off track. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're we need to go back on track. Uh, so. Where do we go from here then? As I said, into the world of Padmasambhava. <clears throat> now, with an open invitation and without reticence, and you know, we know it's all okay. So, the the extraordinary thing about that bridge technique that we did at the end of the day yesterday is that you can use that that bridge technique, being the awareness of the breath, is that you can use that as a way of really becoming familiar with the stillness of awareness. So you, some of you who are familiar with what I was teaching you know, until this year, uh, and what you know, was all based on Alan's progression, uh, after you reach stage four of shamatha, you, know, you don't have to wait to that point, but uh, that would be the natural point. Where basically, when you're not losing your object any longer altogether, because of the effectiveness of <coughs> adding the mute switch to the wandering mind with tactile sensations, then you have a choice about where to go from there. And you could either continue in the typical Theravadan approach of more and more subtle tactile sensations until you reach that quiet sign at level six or so. And then, or you could do what Padmasambhava recommends, and that is that you take this, go to this next practice that we're going to do, which is settling the mind in its natural state. And then, um, so a year ago, then I would have had to say, we would have just gone there from, so you go directly from tactile sensations of the breath to then trying to maintain the stillness of your awareness, monitoring, <clears throat> watching, witnessing the ever-changing parade of mental appearances. So frankly, that, I think, is really daunting to just throw, it's like throwing you to the lions, because asking you to, one, go directly from stable attention to stillness of awareness without really knowing what that stillness of awareness feels like, and then maintain that stillness of awareness while you're just in Times Square of the mind. Uh, that's challenging. <coughs> and so the, the difficult thing is that if you enter that practice without the proper preparation of, of having established some stillness of awareness, that you're then going to be Shanghai constantly by every appearance that comes along because you know the ones that do show up that you know are bubble up into the, the froth of, of awareness and become appearances you know are often ones that have a strong emotional valence a charge to them and so they naturally our habit is to grasp onto them and tell a story about them argue with them define them refute them on and so that, that's a very difficult solve them. That's the one thing that we really want to solve. But the, um, so now you have 
a different, now you can develop the stillness of awareness with the awareness of the breath, because the awareness, or the breath, is the one thing, the breath is the bridge from the shore of attention to the shore of awareness. It's like the corpus callosum, almost, of, of the brain, you know, that is connecting the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Uh, maybe not too literally. But the, uh, so, but it's the bridge. You can take the breath that you use to develop stability with to develop stillness of awareness with, because that breath is such a familiar object. But now, so remember that the technique then for developing the stillness of awareness is that you are aware of sensations, of tactile sensations of the breath, wherever they occur in the body. Without, so you're not. It's no longer selective and focused attention. It's open and receptive presence with tactile sensations of the breath. So then, we are, uh, you use that stillness of awareness then to, we, we have then shifted to the breath as a mental event, and now we're going with Padmasambhava into the space of the mind and mental appearances that arise there. So now we are going to take that stillness of awareness. And the object now is no longer the breath, not even knowing the breath, but it is the space of the mind and whatever mental appearances arise there. So is the point then in this practice, so there's a a uh, subset of the settling the mind in its natural state practice called taking the mind as the path. And that's what we are going to be doing now, taking the mind as the path. And so is in this practice of taking the mind as the path, and remember when we were focused on tactile sensations of the breath, because attention is selective and focused. I am selectively focused on tactile sensations of the breath at the nose. And any mental appearance is a distraction. And so you release it and get back to your selective focus on the breath. So we, what are we trying to do then what, with this taking the mind as the path? Are we trying to eliminate all mental appearances not with this practice. There is another practice later where we just do that, where we just rest in awareness with no object, but not here. What we are doing is trying to be present with mental appearances and just without grasping to them. So what does it mean before to practice without distraction? Before, it meant to maintain the continuity of your mindfulness on tactile sensations of the breath. Here, what it means is to maintain the stillness of your awareness as you witness the ever-changing parade of mental appearances without grasping to any of them. So really what we are trying to do here is to become lucid. You know, uh, and one of the, the best elucidations of what that term means actually comes from lucid dreaming. So you know what it's like in lucid dreaming. If you haven't experienced it, you know what it's, uh, you know, the, you've heard about it. So lucid dreaming at least knows that you are dreaming. So that is non-lucid dreaming. What happens? You see a flying pig or water running uphill and you, you take it at face value. And the most outlandish images, they don't get your attention. It's just, you know, part of the phantasmagoria of the dreamscape, right? I mean, if we were lucid, we would go, come on, a flying pig? I must be dreaming, 
Right? So that's exactly what you do in developing lucid dreaming. One of the uh, best techniques developed by Stephen Lebert, Jean Allen, is that uh, you do state checks when when you are see outlandish images. Uh, you know that you go, oh come on, a flying pig, water running uphill. I'm could I? That's weird. How weird? Could I be dreaming? And then you do a state check. You know, you pull your nose, jump up in the air, a couple of other things possible. But you do a state check, and then you say, oh yeah, I am, now I am lucid because I know I am dreaming. So that's what we are attempting to do is with this practice, is to become lucidly awake, meaning that we recognize appearances for what they are, meaning they are appearances within the space of the mind. Because most of the time, we are non-lucid. There was, at the time of the Buddha, a tracker in the forest. And, you know, one of the, uh, the signs, the major marks of a Buddha is a Dharma wheel on the soles of the feet. So this tracker saw these very strange prints in the forest. <laughs> and so he followed these strange prints to this person, led him to this person, and he said, who are you? Are you a god? No. Are you a wizard? No. Are you a deva? No. Are you human? No. Well, who are you? What are you? I am awake. So the Buddha knew that if he had said, yes, I am human, that the tracker would have understood, yes, I am human like you. But he's not. It's so different that it, you have to call it something else. I am a lucid human. I am an awake human. And the best way to say it is, I am awake. So that's what we're trying to do, is to wake up, and wake up in the waking state. I mean, to become lucid in the waking state, in the same way that you can become lucid in the dream state, meaning, in a, a dream you are, when you are lucid, you know that all of these appearances aren't real. A flying pig, come on. It's a dream. It's only a dream image. So what about walking across through the streets of New York City? All of these things, so alluring, so threatening, so repulsive, whatever. Objects that exist out there independent of my perception of them. Right? Time for a state check. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so that's what we do, is to do state checks all throughout the day. Whenever a mental affliction arises, oh, come on, that person, I'm, is pissing me off of that person I'm craving, or whatever, you know? Time for a state check. And I <laughs> reapply that appearance. So I should tell you, you know, when you're in a lucid dream, the state check is when you pull your nose, it'll be like Pinocchio. It'll be putty, so it'll pull out. So that's the state check. And if it, it and so during the, the day, uh, do that. You know, if something outlandish happens, and just do a state check. This actually is a preparation for a practice, a Vipassana practice in uh, Padmasambhava world uh, um, called the dream practice or dream yoga of the waking state. And so you are constantly doing state checks then to see if you are being deluded by these appearances, by your if you're being taken in by the appearance and you're not recognizing the reification. So that's what you are trying to do, is to recognize the reification. Ah, I am giving that an independent, solid, concrete existence that of course it doesn't have. Because how do I, what is the truth of that experience? It is a, a mental appearance. It is a mental appearance arising within the space of the mind. So, that is what we are trying to, that is, if we were lucidly awake, that is, would be our experience. This is the Dzogchen world.
uh, of recognizing all appearances as mere appearances arising within the space of the mind. And so the space of the mind then, I am getting off track, uh, <laughs> is something that becomes very familiar to us then, our, of our experience. Just the, the space of the mind, even when there are no appearances arising, the space of the mind, and then you watch these appearances bubble. And so when that happens, when you're familiar with, when you're just settled in the stillness of awareness, and an appearance arises, are you going to crave it? Are you going to loathe it? Are you going to resist it and try to repel it? Are you going to experience craving or hostility? No, you won't, because there's no delusion. You're lucid. You're recognizing that all of these are just appearances arising within the space of the mind. How powerful if, if that becomes our daily experience, right? Or moment, momentary, momentary experience. If we are deluded or non-lucid 23 hours a day or 23 hours and 50 minutes a day, and we are able to become lucid at critical moments, you know, just as somebody is about to, just as I'm about to give somebody a piece of my mind. And you know what piece of my mind I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. The worst piece, you know? If, if you could become lucid at that moment, imagine, you know, and recognize, oh, this is an appearance arising within the space of mind. You know, how different life could be. So, uh, and it's all just part of training. So we're, we're going to try to get there, to become, to wake up. And this is what the Buddha meant, that we are going to become lucid. So, it's Mother's Day. <laughs> we know that our mind, our, no, I should say our experience, the world of our experience is not filled with just sensory reports. When we are not lucid, it feels like that. It feels like I am a, an unbiased receiver, a sense receiver of a world that exists out there independently in the way of what's called simple-minded realism or naive realism, meaning that there are all independent objects out there, like in the way of classical physics, which nobody believe, has believed for 120 years except for, guess who? mind scientists. Physicists haven't thought that for 120 years. They're cognitive scientists. That's still the way they operate. They, they need to go to school, I think. And which is why this is going to be regarded as the dark ages of mind science. We're just beginning to wake up in the last 15 years. And it's thrilling and exciting, right on the cusp of this whole new world of understanding the mind in, in the Western world. Um, But we know that <laughs> uh, that's a real tangent that uh, we can go on for the rest of the day. The, so it seems like we are unbiased receivers, sense receivers, of, of solid independent objects that exist out there. And I am an unbiased sense receiver. Well, you're not, but I am. You know, I'm a trained reporter, after all. I am, you know, trained to be objective. You know, and I have words to prove that, how objective I am, you know. So, if, you know, you want to find out what's going on, ask me, right? But we all feel that, right? So, two people in a dyad, well, you know, I understand why you're mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it feels like that, doesn't it? That I am an unbiased perceiver. Okay, so, but really we know that our experience is filled with more than just sense reports. There's a large component, a mental world. So, when I say your mother, your mother, Something comes to mind. You have an experience, I should say, right? Your mother. You have an experience, whether your mother is alive or dead, whatever. You, you have an experience right now. Your mother is not here. 
I don't think. Well, no, that's not entirely true. <laughs> <laughs> there is what it sits. But uh, uh, for most of us, our mother is not here. Our mothers are not here. Uh, and but still, we are having an experience. So we we are not at this moment smelling her fragrance, feeling her, uh, you know, seeing her. But we are having an experience. The taste of chocolate. You're having an experience. So what we are trying to do with this experience of Taking the mind is the path. The taste of chocolate. The next time you have chocolate on your tongue, try to distinguish how much of the taste of chocolate that you just experienced is part of the taste of chocolate on your tongue. We so we we normally you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We conflate the conceptual, the taste of chocolate right now isn't here, but you have an experience of it. The, and at some point, you are going to have the taste of chocolate on your tongue again. And how much of the conceptual mental experience is actually part of the experience of taste of the chocolate on your tongue? We conflate constantly the conceptual and the perceptual and think that the conceptual is actually a quality of the perceptual, constantly, right? So being lucid means being able to, to wake up to watching the conceptual overlay onto the perceptual. So at this point, we'll just say that there, there are, you are getting perceptual data, without a doubt. I mean, you're not saying, I'm not saying that there is no world out there independent of my perception. But the only way that I can experience it is through, as an appearance within my mind. But it seems like everything is so out there independent, solid, real. Remember, even in a dream, ouch, that wall feels really solid. I could feel pain in a dream. Right? Is that proof? Is the, the hardness of the wall, my sensory perception of the hardness of the wall, is that proof that I'm awake? No. I would have that same experience dreaming. Same experience dreaming. Like that, the chocolate on the tongue, how do you separate? that experience from the current experience of chocolate perceived on the tongue? Because am I not cognizing it at some point? Yeah, you are. But the what you're doing is recognizing it as an appearance, rather than as something independent, that, the, that your experience of chocolate isn't in the chocolate, but that your experience is a subjective experience. And so everything just becomes appearances. Rather, so as I say, my shorthand for this, and I think that since you all have been thinking about getting a tattoo, that this would be a good one to get. Uh, someplace prominent, you know, maybe on the wrist here or something, you know. Uh, it, it would be good to put it on the forehead. <laughs> but, uh, but you want to be able to see it. You know, not only when you're looking in the mirror. And that is no objects, only events. So objects, this is the illusion that things are, that objects, that because the object, there are certainly things out there. And I mean, there, it's a long, long story of, of how things may exist independent of perception and why it's ridiculous question in a sense. Um, but the, there are no objects. There are the objects the object that I experience is an illusion. All it is is an event, an appearance within the space of my mind. 
that, that was my question. Why is that not an event when I really taste chocolate? Oh, that is. It. So that is exactly what it is. It is an event. It's just different from the current event that I'm having when you say chocolate. Well, uh, so it's an important question, so we are going to take it. Sorry. Uh, a little crack here. <coughs> um, so what is it in prasangika? What, what are three things that are absolutely necessary for any object, any phenomenon? Face. So first, first of all, you need to cause it. So I'll go in the order in which they're discussed. Causes and conditions. You need suitable causes and conditions for, so how is this experience different than the mental experience? Of, so ontologically, they are different. I'm not going to say that this, that I'm dreaming right now, because there are different states of awareness. So it's causes and conditions. Part of the causes of this, you know, the brick manufacturer, the laborers, the raw material that went into this, etc., the buildings of it, etc. So causes and conditions, a suitable basis. Uh, so a suitable basis is that the raw materials, etc., have been stacked, they're mortared, etc. So this is a suitable basis to what apply the third one, the conceptual designation onto, so you, you apply a conceptual designation onto a suitable basis that is produced by causes and conditions. So that's the, the actual experience of chocolate on your tongue has all three of those things. And the mental event has all three of those things too, but they are different causes and conditions, a different basis, right? So, yeah, we're not saying that everything is all just a mashed potatoes. Everything has different causes and conditions. But the interesting thing is that the conceptual designation of that and in the dream state is very similar. The conceptual designation of the taste of chocolate right now and the taste of chocolate on my tongue. So that's the one that is interesting to try to watch as it's happening. And so yeah, I think you get the idea that if you are going to watch that, as it's happening in real time, you need some very stable, vivid attention because it's happening moment to moment to moment. 50 per second or 64 per finger snap. You know, that's how fast it could be happening. So you have to be able to slow down the whole mental experience to watch mental appearances. So that's what we are going to be doing in this practice. <clears throat> so what to be practicing without distraction then, in when we were focused on tactile sensations meant that you were stably focused on tactile sensations. Now it means that we do not grasp to a mental appearance. So a mental appearance arises. What we are going to do is to try to practice as so chenpas among Tibetans say, let awareness hold its own ground. Meaning let awareness remain still. Don't be seduced. Don't grasp onto one of these mental appearances because in the way that we typically do in our ruminating mind, our default wandering mind. An appearance comes up, we grasp onto it, we go off with it. Ten minutes later, we wake up and go, whoa, how did I get here? So we are going to try to remain lucid, to remain, so that the trick to that, how do you know whether you are grasping to an appearance or not? Wouldn't it be nice if there were a precursor to grasping that was a because once the grasping occurs, remember the executive function gets recruited into the default mode or into the default network. In my terms, 
the century gets shanghai along with the mindfulness. So it's very, very difficult if you are not lucid. So if you're lucid, you can watch a mental appearance arise. Uh, if you grasp onto it, as soon as it does arise, off you go. So the, wouldn't it be nice if there were some way of recognizing when grasping was about to happen? I think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> and that is preferring that this appearance be different. So we know that a very attractive appearance we would prefer be different. How? Because we would like it to stay. We would like the next instance of my experience to be that one. And then, you know, maybe tomorrow too, and maybe how about you and me for eternity? <laughs> I think I've found it. <laughs> this is the one. You know, I'm willing to you know, settle down with you. <laughs> you know, we all have our version of that. Maybe it's as simple as the taste of chocolate. <laughs> but an appearance, an attractive appearance arises, and we would like it to you know, remain. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It's a changing thing, but we grasp onto it. Uh, an anxious appearance, or a threatening appearance, a depressing appearance, a repulsive appearance, all of those we would like to change also. We would like it to get the hell out of here. Leave me alone, right? Both of those, there's a, you get the idea, well, uh, what's the problem? One is that, well, it's impermanence is the problem. and the one in so repulsive things we feel are, are permanent, and if I don't punch it, it's going to stay. Uh, and if the, the attractive ones, we want to be permanent, and the problem is that they are impermanent, and so we cling to them. So what we, what we are trying to do, so it's the uh, grasping meaning that we are about to lose the stillness of our awareness, because that is what launches aware the stillness of your awareness into motion. It, it becomes cognitively fused with the appearance, with, and it becomes an object. It becomes cognitively fused. We grasp to it. So uh, that's the key, then. To remain an impassive witness, let your awareness remain an impassive witness as these appearances arise, without preferring that they be different. Just let them be. And so, the uh, what we are trying to do then, if we can, what's the the key? How do you know that your you are lucidly remaining present with these appearances without grasping for them. How, how, what is the sure sign? That is that you are able to watch the entire life cycle of a mental appearance. It has arisen. It is present for some time. And then, if you don't grasp to it, it will dissolve back into the space of the mind from which it arose. It feels like, especially with anxious appearances, that if we don't push them away, if we don't resist them, that they have moved in with us, that this is the new normal, that it is going to be with me when I wake up tomorrow, and I am never going to be free of this thing unless I resist it, push it away, suppress it, repress it, throw it in the cellar, and put my heavy foot on the door. Uh, it feels like that, doesn't it? But you don't have to do that. All you have to do is allow it, witness it, remain an impassive witness, and it will go. And of course, you, you know what I mean, that 
the resistance. Grasping to is not only clinging. Grasping to also means pushing away, resisting. Either way, whether you, you're preferring it to be different, get the hell out of here or stay with me forever. You know, it's both grasping. And so you have just turned an event into an object. You have changed it. You, because based on your delusion. Is the most important appearance to watch the way yourself arises? Well, that's uh, we're, go- we're going there. Uh, I think it'll be best for questions. Sit with your questions. Don't don't follow an impulse to ask a question. Because I'm going to get to your your. I almost guarantee that any question you have, I'm going to get to. And it will be a lot better if it comes up in a progression. Because that's a very good, that's a very important question. And if I answer it now, it's going to blow it. Um, so, and it, it throws me off my train of thought. So I have to, it's like multitasking. I have to reboot now, because I was really in a flow. And now I have to figure out where the hell I was again. I know you didn't intend to do that. Um, so where we are, uh, what would the, the practice, the key to this practice is something that Padmasambhava calls, uh, or yeah, so Padmasambhava calls, there's a, a particular type of mindfulness, the first type of mindfulness, which is called the fusion of stillness and motion. And so this is what we are trying to do, is to be simultaneously aware of the stillness of our awareness. Remember that one? That from the stillness of our breath, or when we were focused on 80% of our awareness was aware of the stillness of our awareness. And we were simultaneously aware of the ever-changing tactile sensations of the breath, and then knowing the changing of the breath. Etc. So that's what exactly what we're doing. That is the fusion of stillness and motion. That we are trying to remain simultaneously aware of the stillness of our awareness. But now the game is a lot more panoramic. It, because this is the Coney Island of the mind. You know, this and we are trying to remain still to allow these mental appearances to simply arise, abide, and dissolve. Normally, we it could be that you have never seen the life cycle of a mental appearance in your life. I think for most of us, we could say that. Because what happens? We become aware of a mental appearance only after it has arisen. And when it has, after it has arisen, we grasp onto it. We become Shanghai by it. And so we then never see it dissolve. So it's only when you are in this stillness of awareness that you are able to actually watch this the entire life cycle. Arise, abide, dissolve. Arise, abide, dissolve. Arise, abide, and dissolve. So the whole at first, it can feel like this is truly a Times Square. You know, it's just a flood of mental appearances coming from this beautiful pastoral setting in Massachusetts <laughs> uh, in, in retreat and, you know, eight hours or more of retreat a day uh, to, you know, land in Times Square. Uh, it's just, it feels like you're trying to drink from a fire hydrant. <laughs> and, you know, so now it's, you know, what the, the whole goal is to watch the whole thing. And as you do, as you maintain the stillness of your awareness, everything becomes to sl- begins to slow down. And then finally, you will reach a point where it, it actually becomes, rather than the fire hydrant, becomes individual drops. And that's exactly what we're talking about. 
individual moments of perception. A, a mental appearance arises, abides, and dissolves. A mental appearance arises, abides, and dissolves. A mental appearance arises, abides, and dissolves. And then eventually there will be space between the mental appearances. Uh, and of course, you know it's the, the same, and it's going to be more so perhaps, especially when you begin this practice, that you are going to be Shanghai, right? It's the default wandering mind. So the you are going to be captured, captivated by some of these appearances. 